last lecture, we'll talk about the process of managing strategic alliances. This is the implementation phase. Many times when you take offensive actions or even defensive actions in the marketplace or decide to compete by managing, by taking actions along your scope, either horizontal scope or vertical scope, and then you're timing your actions when you want to enter the marketplace, the first mover, do you want to follow, do you want to see what develops. Um, as you're doing them, you often do that in the context of working with other players that bring assets to the table that you don't have and that need the assets that you can bring to the table. And these are strategic, strategic alliances. They're typically agreements between organizations about creating some new product or service or offering some new support infrastructure that benefits both players. It's a win-win kind of a situation. These are partnerships between organizations, but they're managed by individual people. And this is one of the reasons why this is such a difficult area to manage, and when you become good at it, these are the people that become very successful as senior executives. Joint ventures are when there's an equity play involved. There's an actual separate company that's created, and the players put money in place, and employees are contributed to the joint venture from both sides, and they become employees of the joint venture. It actually creates a separate entity. Um, there are um, reasons for doing this and reasons for not doing that that we, uh, we will talk about over the course of, uh, of our case analyses as we go forward. What makes something strategic? Generally, an alliance with another company is strategic if it serves one of our strategic purposes, if it operates for one of these offensive strategies described, if it operates to help the defensive positioning by having a partner, like a partnership with a distribution channel, a lot might lock out a third player, so that's a defensive strategy. If it, if it provides one of these objectives, that helps. It helps create a competence or sustain a competence that we have in the market or, or keep someone else from coming into place. It might provide a resource deficiency that we don't have if, you're, if you need to have something manufactured very uh, effectively and cheaply and in mass and you don't have the skills to do that. You're a small design house, you design a new product, you need someone to manufacture it. Partnering with a good manufacturing supply operation is one good example of that. You can also partner to open new, op new marketplaces when a company oftentimes wants to expand to another country, they might do so with a strategic alliance with an existing player in that company, not a competitor, but someone who's complementary. And it also, because you're partnering with somebody, you tend to mitigate the risk. Important to note, strategic partnerships work when they're specifically, when they're very selective about what you're trying to do in terms of what assets you bring in by partnering and what you're putting on the table to help the other side. They help organizations learn from the other organization. Toyota and General Motors had a joint venture years ago. Toyota learned about the US marketplace and taste. General Motors learned about how Toyota manufactures its products and services. When you enter strategic alliances, you are essentially more than doubling the strategic positioning you have because you have your positioning plus whatever the alliance partner brings to the table. So if you want to position yourself as a leader in some way, you tend to, to enter this marketplace with someone else who has a strong position. Uh, you might want to enter a country this way or whatever. But what you're trying to do effectively is lead in some area, and you do that with another player that brings complementary assets that no one else in the industry really has. That's a way, if you think about it, you're essentially surrounding a competitor by bringing another organization to play in helping you compete in the marketplace. You might, and using that, you can tend to stake out a much stronger position. If you're a, you find a, a retailer like Target or Nordstrom's that becomes the exclusive distributor of your new product or service, in other words, they don't sell anyone else's similar product then you've pos positioned a partic particularly strong place in the marketplace. Now, that only may be for the first six months, but still, you're positioning and strengthening your first mover advantage in that kind of environment. So typically, what makes these things successful is that you're, um, you try to find the, the right partner, that is, somebody who you can work with that has the assets you need, 
but also typically it benefits from what you bring because this is win-win. You're not trying to get something from them. You're also giving to the table. You want to be, uh, be careful about how their organization works, some of their cultural differences, that sort of thing. Um, there are multiple ways of thinking about the kinds of products or the kinds of relationships that you might want to develop. And you want to also make sure that you, um, you complement with your products and your brands. They don't clash, if you will, but they complement the environment and they, they, put, um, they position both organizations better in a way that the, the customer understands the relationship as well. You also want the agreement to be able to be adjustable over time. Um, things change. You don't want to be too rigid. You want to have the ability, some sort of overarching structural decision-making process that allows you to adapt and change over time. Um, and you want to make sure that you have a, a, a way in place that you can manage. You understand. You get data from the joint venture or the alliance, and you know how to act and how to move forward and how to change the agreement over time, and when the time comes, if necessary, terminate the agreement. There's a lots of different factors that you bring into play as you create these relationships with other organizations. Many of the challenges are just the people are different. They grew up in different worlds. They came from different, quote, neighborhoods, different companies, and they're often different. And sometimes what you expect it to happen doesn't actually materialize. Uh, one side may be getting what they need, but perhaps not the other side. Um, also, sometimes one firm becomes dependent on the other firm. Um, the, one of the players in the alliance does all of the activities. For example, they're the ones that were the China partner, and you're entering the Chinese marketplace. They still continue to have all the relationships, and you don't really get anything. You're not any closer to entering the China market than you were before because that company is essentially controlling all that, the relationships within that country. Um, also, sometimes there's leakage of proprietary processes, knowledge, all that sort of thing. So you have to be careful of various elements of, um, of a strategic alliance process. These are typically multiple year deals. So as you can see, strategy is not something that is once and done. You develop your analysis of uh, of the external environment, you figure out what you don't want to do, and as you're implementing it, you put, put an alliance in place, um, three to five years, even longer than that, potentially. You want to have a system for managing that, make sure the relationships work. There's generally something like a steering committee with some three people from the one company and three people from the other company. Um, you want to make sure that, that the organizations don't, one organization doesn't take advantage of the other. That's opportunism. Um, the partners agree to meet and discuss things. There's typically annual or biannual events that you get together, and the people that are uh, high up in the organization that are managing these these businesses or these alliances uh, get together, and they have joint appearances, and they present themselves to customers jointly, um, that sort of thing. And you make sure that there's a way to learn from the process so that the the uh, joint venture or the strategic alliance grows over time and becomes more effective, or if it doesn't, that there's a natural way that the companies part and go their own way, but do so having both felt that they've gained from the overarching experience. These are very difficult things to manage, but they're such an important part of strategy, and we'll talk more about these as we go through our strategic projects and case discussions over the course of, um, of the rest of the, of the uh, the rest of the program here. Um, so that's the uh, that'll be the end. This is our last lecture on this particular module. In this case, we talked about the various options we have about implementing strategic change and how often they are done by using the benefits and the complementary uh, assets, complementary positioning of other players in the industry. So we all work together to enhance each of our own strategic position over time. That's how we build alliances in business, and that's how businesses that have become very successful sustain themselves in a changing ecosystem. So we'll see you in the next module.